I'd love to know your very first childhood memory musically. What's your very first child, musical childhood memory? Musical what? Childhood memory. Oh, musical childhood yeah. memory. Um, I can remember uh, slowing up the record to get Oh, I bet you if someone approached you yesterday to tell you that you would be jamming, you would not believe it because you never thought that you would be jamming. That's by uh, Stevie Wonder. I remember slowing that up and, uh, just to get that because I couldn't understand what he was saying. I was so interested to, to hear what he was saying so I could learn it. And that was like one of the hardest things I heard Stevie Wonder do. So I wanted to get that. So I, I remember that I was about, I guess, 12, uh, 13. That's very funny you said that. I did the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> did you get I it? I did exactly. I didn't get every no, single I'll word, but I did exactly that. the same. Yeah, it was brilliant. A genius. <clears throat> um, that's just an aside, to be honest. I, and I, I did that. In, I mean, I want to know what the first instrument you ever played, picked up was, and the first instrument you ever had a, an affinity with. The guitar. My mom bought a, um, me a guitar, my brother a bass guitar, and, and my other brother a drum set. And, uh, Mine was like the lead guitar, that was the first instrument. And what's the first thing you ever composed on that guitar? A song that I, just a musical thing, doom, 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 that's all I knew. You didn't put <laughs> lyrics to that? No. no, I couldn't put lyrics. I wasn't in a writing um, situation then. I didn't know how to write a song, but musically. You said your <laughs> mum bought you the guitar. Um, did you come from a musical fam family? Oh yeah, yeah, my mom sang. My sister sang, and of course, like my my brother played bass, and my other brother played drums. It seemed as if, you know, black <coughs> kids, working class backgrounds, music was such a an important part of of life, especially in the like 70s and 80s. It was just such a, you know, every, everybody I've spoken to seems to say if it was either church, it was either music, always playing in the house, or somebody in my in my family was musical. D did you find that in, amongst your peers at that time? Yeah, I found the same thing around the 70s, especially around 74, you know, it was all love, you know, it was like music was more uh, effective, you know, uh, if you hear a love song come out uh, uh, by the Isleys or, or anyone like that, I mean, you, or Marvin Gaye, you, you, it would make you uh, want to make love or make you want to love or come closer to your family or your woman or your wife. You know, it was it was definitely more effective back then. Because obviously now with rap music being so dominant, especially through the eighties, that whole you don't get that sense that that, that that is going on as much. You know, there's kind of more of an ag an angst and a kind of anger out there. So uh, did that I mean, doing music for someone like myself was seen as no, you don't want to do music, that's like dancing, you know. Mm -hmm. you, you get what I'm saying? So yeah. <clears throat> Having that background, your family behind you, did, and I know about your school, and I know about a certain lady that I'd like you to, to, to tell us about mm -hmm. who inspired you mm -hmm. and, and, and encouraged you to, to do your music. Can you mm -hmm. tell us a bit about her? Well, that's Lena McGlynn, like my second mother, and uh, she's a pastor and everything. Uh, my, te my music teacher in, in high school. Uh, in high school, my freshman year, I was uh, starting on Kenwood's basketball team, which is the name of my high school. And, uh, but I happened to have a music class. At that point in time, I wasn't, I think I was about 16, 17. I, I, was not, I was not interested in music. I was really trying to be the next Michael Jordan, of course. And um, she told me that I would sing, you know, I would uh, be the next Stevie Wonder or superstar, or Michael Jackson or something like that. And I, and I laughed at her like she was crazy, you know. I was. I couldn't see it, and everything I am today, she could see it, my mother could see it, and, and uh, she would tell me that uh, I was going to be where I'm at today and even further, so, and it just, it just happened. I, I, she put me in a talent show, and uh, I did the talent show, and, and the girls were screaming and everything, and I was like, man, I, I don't get this kind of love on the court, <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, of course, I'm going to choose that over basketball, and I did, and I've been doing it ever since. So what, would, you, would you say that was your big break or, or was there a stage a little further down the line that was the significant break for your music? I would say my big break is, is that point in time I learned that Stevie Wonder uh, riff. That was one of the steps because I, I felt like, man, if I learned that, I can learn anything because that guy was going pretty fast. But 
as far as crowd wise and what nailed it, I would say my first talent show um, pretty much is what bit me in a way. Like um, Peter Parker got bit by the spider and became Spider Man. You know that was that was the bite for me. You know when the, when the, when the women and everybody was showing me so much love at the talent show and I won and and I was like wow it was it was overwhelming. Can you relive that <coughs> fear and energy that you had the first time you went on stage and had to actually compete to try and win? you know, like a talent competition? Because that must be just, a, a, for a young guy, a really awesome experience. Well, I had my eyes closed through the whole thing, so I, I just heard everything. Uh, the idea is she put me in these black glasses and had a friend of mine walk me out on the stage like I was Stevie Wonder, and um, she had me sing Ribbon in the Sky. And, I, man, as soon as I started singing, the crowd, the crowd started cheering and screaming and... Um, and all I can remember is ending it. And when I ended it, the people were standing up, they told me, because I kept my eyes closed until he walked me back off the stage. The best way to act blind is to close your eyes. <laughs> so that's what I did. Did you do that when you got signed to Jive? What, what happened there? Did, was, that, was that a song or some demos that you, you did? or? Yeah, um, management. Um, actually, I had got into some um, situation with management that I was uh, with before I even got signed with Jive. And, uh, I had a manager skip out of town with some money that we had won you know, from a talent show. And there was a lot of trouble with that. And, and the, day, the day I broke up with him was actually the day I was bumming a transfer trying to get a, uh, a bus to get home. And uh, I was walking down uh, 79th and I walked past the Regal theater and it said a gospel play was going on and I went in there and uh, I asked the guy, I said, yo man, uh, any more auditions going on? He said, no, nah, we just closed it up, man. I said, man, give me a chance, man. Let me do something. I'm on my last dime here, you know, and they were like, um, well, that's it, man. So I started singing anyway and I sang a song, Amazing Grace, and they introduced me to Barry Hankinson. I sang to Barry Hankinson and, and uh, he offered to put me in the play. And I said, you know, that's great, that's great. And so as time went on, I come to find out he wanted me to, um, I, want, I told him that I could write. I didn't want to do the play. I want to write and do my own album. So once I showed him a couple of songs on the piano and a couple of demos, he was like, my God, you write, you can write. You know, let, let's take you to Jive Records. And that's what we did. Do you want to sip your coffee? I'm good. You cool? I'm okay. Um, <laughs> takes me to Born Into the 90s. Uh, a phenomenal debut album and something that didn't really tell us whether you were going to be a big balladeer or a club guy because uh. you know you, you really came off big with She Got That Vibe. Mm -hmm. So tell me in, in hindsight now looking back on that album where did you see your strengths and weaknesses? Did you use that album as a kind of tester for you, you know, for what was to come? Yeah that's exactly what I did with the uh, Born Into the 90s album uh, once I found out I had an album deal and we were going to the studio to do an album, I was like searching. I was like, man, I got all of these melodies and songs in me. I don't know what to do first. And um, I just listened to the radio and just calmed down, listened to the radio and kind of, um, you know, like the stocks, you know, you see what's, ho what's hot and what's not. And, uh, and I saw the up tempos were in at that point in time. And uh, so I went in and did uh, She's Got That Vibe. Uh, which was the last song on the album, and uh, and did a couple of ballads just in case. You know, I was pretty much searching at that point in time. That's quite unusual that you're actually admitting that you you know that you're aware that maybe I'm going to go that way, maybe I'm going to go that. Because some people just go, well, I wrote that from the heart, and that's my first album. That's what I'm about. End of story. Man, I didn't have a clue. I was like, I just wanted it to work. I, my hunger was there more than anything, and uh, me being hungry, I. I'm, I'm always like that. I'm nervous. What will the people like? What are they feeling? I try to figure out what the, what is the world feeling right now uh, with my first two albums. You know, that's how I was. Well, let's talk about the second album because you know, in this day and age, and history always says the second album is the most difficult to grow from a first into a second album. Mm -hmm. and develop as an artist. Are you pleased with the outcome of the second album? Exactly the direction you took. I mean, has it all gone exactly how R. Kelly wanted it to go? Yeah, the, the 12 Play album. Um, really how that whole 12 Play album came about is I was on tour with Gerald Levert. 
and uh, we were opening up for him. You know, we were the opening act, trying to prove, still trying to prove myself. So, um, and Gerald had all of the lights and the smoke and the fog and the, just the big production, you know. And I was like, wow, I can't wait to get to that point. And I figured the only thing that was going to get me to that point, because I had like a flashlight and a mic, <laughs> you know, when I was opening up for Gerald. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to give me much, but you know. So, but I, I, I said to myself, I have to do something out there on that stage that that'll make people forget about the lights and the whole nine. You know, I got to throw down. You know, um, to get to the next level, I need to know how to perform without all of that. And that's when I came up with Twelve Play. It was actually a song in uh, in my show. It had nothing to do with anything that was on my album, but. I said, man, I'm gonna put this 12 play on my show. I'm gonna write that song so the women can scream. Cause I know if they, if I count down from 12 to one, or from one to 12, what I'm gonna do to them, I know they gonna go crazy, you know? <laughs> Cause that's the way I feel, you know? So that's what I did and it worked. It worked tremendously for us, man. I mean, it, you know, I, I, I finally hit something that I knew was automatic gimmick in my show. And, um, People, they, the women was on their feet, everybody was barking and everything. So I said, man, I'm gonna put this on my album, my next album, my second album. And then it ended up being the title of the album. Well, from a UK perspective, you know, your shows have always been, even the first tour mm -hmm. was so well received. You know, you were, yeah, you were huge on the, on the underground scene particularly. First in the UK, I'm sure you would, you'd love the support you received over there. Oh yeah, a lot of love. It was, it was amazing. <laughs> I, I, I can't explain the feeling over there, man. I mean, everybody was like, I, f I felt like, man, what is this? Is, is Michael Jackson standing behind me? And when I turn around, he ain't there, you know? That's how I felt because they were screaming. Up some, some nights, I didn't even know what they were screaming at, you know? But they was telling me, man, they just love you, man. And, I, and that just really made me feel good and inspired me to go in and even come up with another album. Okay, before we talk about that other tour, the second tour you did over there, let's talk about the tracks on 12 play because the first time I interviewed you we talked about your body's calling and bump and grind being almost like signature tunes for the 90s like Marvin's let's get it on was mm -hmm. in the in the 70s and um, do, do you feel I mean at that point after you were the she's got that vibe man almost then you you came with you know the sex the kind of more sexy angle and you became a sex symbol how did you cope with that that whole instant boom your career escalated and you were a sex symbol as well well, I started saying things like, um, I can hear someone over there calling me, oh, who? The crowd would just go crazy. Then I walk down there, I can hear someone over there calling me, oh, who? And they'd go crazy. This before body calling was even, it w w was born. You know, and, and little gimmicks like that, and ooh, na, 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 na. Crowd go, yo, body, na, na. And it was just amazing, little gimmicks that, were, that I was doing on my show. I never thought that I would take it into the studio and say, okay, I'm gonna make a whole song out of your body calling, your body's calling me. But um, that's, that's how these songs came about. And, um, and, I, and as the more I started doing that, the more I started deciding, well, I'm just gonna start saying what I feel. Because I would always say on my stage, do you mind if I say what I feel right now? And they would love it, and then I'd say what I feel. See, I'm feeling kind of horny right now. And they would snap, you know. And, but that's what I would feel, and I'd say what I feel. People appreciate me keeping it real with them. And um, everybody wants to know what you really feel. You know, especially when you're, you're known, they want to know what you're really thinking. So I was giving them what, what was on my mind and on my heart at that particular time. You, you, you reckon you found your niche there, really, at that point? I mean, it, it, everybody, a lot of, of R&B artists were trying to do that kind of thing, but you kind of did it just that bit better. Mm. Well, I, I think it's because after I started doing it, a lot of people would, would follow, uh, if you don't mind. I mean, a lot of people would follow in a humble way, I say that. But, you know, it, you know it's a difference when you, when you mean it. You know, you do it, when I came up with it, it came out of me from my belly. And I, I did it because that's what I felt, and that's what was on my mind. Other, a lot of other people, when they, when they did it, 
they were inspired to do it. And it's a difference, you know, it's a difference in who created the light bulb and then who turned it on. It's a big difference. People were doing it because they knew it worked. Yeah. I mean, I was exactly. at Wembley Arena when you did that call and response thing, and you had like 10,000 people instantly giving you that vibe back. So mm -hmm. that's a clue into also how you write some of your songs because we're going to talk about this later about your songwriting and how you, you, you said you, you, you fed from the crowd and you went back to a studio and then you wrote a song mm -hmm. from, what you, from your experience at that moment there. Is that, is, that, is that one of the key ways that you actually write your material? Yeah, that, that's um, for the, not for the most part, but I would say 30% of it, you know, is when I'm out there, you know, because I'm always throwing out, I'm very spontaneous on stage. And every night is something new. Every night I, I may say something that, that it, and it's a smash. And if it's a smash, I'm going to keep it throughout the tour. You know, I'm saying, man, everybody goes crazy when I go, ooh, na, 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 what? Your body, na, 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 na. That was just something I tried on the show, and it was such a great response that I decided to do it in a song. Where did you feel you were going to go from there? At that point, you came off the tour, you just had success with the album. Were you just excited about the future? Where did you think it was next, or were you kind of nervous about, hang on, Bump and Grime was, was the b biggest R&B record for 30 years on the R&B chart, and you know people are saying this is great. This, is great, but where do I go from here? Yeah, always nervous, man. I'm always, I'm a nervous wreck, uh, and I'm, but ex it's an exciting type of nervousness. You know, I'm excited to do it again, but I'm nervous because I'm like, man, can I do it again? You know, I believe, but you know, it, it's, it's hard to do. Sit in one room in Chicago in a studio and read the minds of millions because that's what you're doing you know when you write a, a, a any song you know you're writing it to put it out but hopefully people will go and buy it Hope, hopefully people will love it hopefully people will come to the concerts because of what you thought in that little bitty room and you know, I'm trying to read the minds of millions you know because I want millions to pack in and millions to go buy the album and millions to love my music so, you know, it, it's, it's a pressure, man. It's a pressure, but um, I welcome it because, you know, I love pressure and I love my music. And I know if you love something you do, it's going to show. We're talking about reaching millions of people and, and reaching millions of people also through the, through the voices of other singers, mm -hmm. which is something that you've, you've proven that you can do as well. I mean, the mark of a truly great songwriter and musician mm -hmm. is when they can work with somebody else or for somebody else. Mm -hmm. At that point, you, you became known as R. Kelly, the great songwriter as well, because you work with everybody that, that matters in R&B. Uh, was that a way of you alleviating that whole pressure of just, it's me, 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 I'm gonna write a song for this person, that person, that person, or did they just ask you and say, man, we need one of your songs for our album? Was it, was it that whole era, it, that time there for you, was that so exciting? Yeah, it was very exciting because I love writing for other people. I love taking my music and uh, uh, transforming into th th that person that I'm working for. You know, uh, for instance, Tony Braxton, I would give, uh, I was just telling somebody this today, I would give Tony Braxton, I wouldn't give Tony Braxton a You Are Not Alone. And that's the exciting thing about my music. That's the exciting thing about, uh, that's the most thing I love about my music because when I write, get to write for people, I get to become them. And they don't understand how I do it, but I do. I understand that I, I totally submit to who they are and I respect them so much and then I'll just give them what I feel they would sing. You Are Not Alone, uh, um, um, Tony Braxton could have never sung that song. It was just so perfect for Michael, I feel. And the same thing with uh, anything else I've done for anyone, I try to write, I just try to pull out of them what I feel they should do. But also one of the, um, our favorite songs on the show last year was Get Out, um, Changing Faces. Mm -hmm. Such a, how can I put it, every woman <laughs> who's ever been through anything yeah. like that yeah. <laughs> totally understands that and that the ability to, uh, you, a woman would have had to have written that song, surely, you know, yeah. that, that, that's what's most yeah. impressive. How, how did you set about writing Get Out? Well, I've, I've sent a woman through that situation. Um, I've, I've sent a woman through that situation. I mean, you, you, some, some things you don't have, it doesn't have to be done to you, but it's some things that you can do to others. Um, and that can inspire you also. 
and that particular thing I, I happen to do to a woman. I've, I've sent enough women through enough problems in my past that I know what they're talking about because they always scream it in my ear. They need to spend time, more time. They think I'm cheating around, which sometimes I was. I mean, sometimes. <laughs> but, you know, I go lie. That happens, you know, and I'm human. That happened. I made bad mistakes. So, um, and through my music, it's my way of saying I'm sorry. It's my way of saying I'm trying to be better. It's my way of saying forgive me. You know, it's my way of saying um, let's make love and just make up. <laughs> but the great thing about it is if you're real out there and people are being honest, <clears throat> they can really relate to it. You know, yeah. you've got a track on your new album, which I'm going to throw to, mm -hmm. called One Man. Mm -hmm. I love that track because any guy who's been out with any girl who's right. been out with another guy right. can absolutely appreciate what you're saying in this mm -hmm. track. Can you just talk us through this tune? Well, um, one man was um, uh, something on, on this album that I, I put on there. It came to me. I, I said that I was going to let this album come to me, this particular album. I wasn't going to go searching for anything. I was going to let it come to me. And this, this uh, one man came to me. It was like my second song. You know, out of the 28 or 29 songs that's on this particular album, this was like the second song. And um, I wrote it from a situation that I had been through, of course, and, and situations that a lot of brothers had been through. I don't even remember, though, what's weird is I don't even remember how I came up with One Man um, because the title is so far to the left and how you would come up. When you say one man, people would not know what what do you mean. So I usually end up saying, well, one man can make one woman hate all men. Now that's not not a negative statement. It's just a true statement, you know. Uh, and, and any woman that hears it be like, you ain't lying. You show sure right about that, you know. Y'all can make us just hate all of y'all. And and I was basically saying, but don't give up on us. You know what I'm saying? Don't let what happened in your past um, mess up our future because I've gotten with girls and I'll take them out to the show or something. They won't even let me open the door for them. I'm like, man, what are you so mad at? I'm a gentleman. I'd like to open the door for you. And this, oh, that's okay. I got it. Well, what are you mad at? You know, who, who ha who's hurt you? Well, I was dealing with this other guy. Well, I, that's not me. That's him. And uh, I've been in enough situations like that where it's pretty much easy for me to come up with something like one man. Let's say one man. To Radio One. <laughs> That's a great song. I love nice that thing. song. The, um, I want to talk a bit more about the songwriting process again. Mm -hmm. because, uh, that was One Man from R. Kelly from his hot new album, R. It's going to be R rated R. I'm not sure which one's it going to be. R rated R. R rated R. R rated R. R, -rated, R. <laughs> but it's all real. Anyway, I'm with R. Kelly. Um, we're talking about his new double album, which is incredible, I have to say. And just talking about some of the tracks and his, his ability to write songs and how he writes songs. Um, you are known as a workaholic, uh, a, a, just a total music man. Much in a way Prince it was known throughout the 80s as somebody who just always wanted yeah. to make music. Mm -hmm. um, are you obsessed with making music? Is it an obsession? Is it just with you? Is it mm, yeah. Um, well, I would say I used to be obsessed with writing and, and making music now, man, it's such a, it's who I am now. It's like, I walk it, you know, I'm married to it. It just comes to me. I don't even mess with it anymore. I used to sit down to the piano and try to figure it out and, and how to try to figure out what my next song is and try to write it. But man, it's so autumn, it's so, it's so nature now, man. It's just when I wake up, or sometimes I wake up out of my sleep, and and, and there's a song I get wake awakened by a song, you know it messes with me sometimes. It just haunts me, you know sometimes, and I welcome it with open arms. I love it, but it's just it's just like you can get hit in a certain spot on your body so much it becomes numb. So that's how writing is for me, man. It's just I feel like it's just it just as I breathe. Has it got anything to do with how tough your background was? Just being, just, you know, just, you, you know, I've read 
interview saying that you did enjoy, you know, growing up in a sense. There are there are parts of growing up that you didn't enjoy, but you you were you know you had a single parent, mm -hmm. you know you had brothers. It must have been tough. Mm -hmm. Is that what drives you on? Is that what keeps you mentally totally focused on 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 winning, winning, winning big time? Yeah, and plus I've always been faced with out of this world decisions and big situations and crazy situ situations. I've been through a lot, you know, of crazy stuff in my past. Of course, uh, I love sitting on the porch, though, with my mom and my brothers and sisters and listening to Al Green or Donnie Hathaway or Stevie Wonder or something like that, just block parties and things like that. But other than that, I've been through a lot. I've seen a lot. Um, and I, I, I believe the depth of your um, struggle determines the height of your success. What you've been through creates a passion for what you're, what you're, going, what you're preparing yourself for. And, um, and in this particular situation, music was something that I was doing, and music affects the world. That's why you hear jazz, you feel jazzy, you hear blues, you feel bluesy, you know, you feel church, you want to cry, you know, you hear it. But I do feel that me going through all of the things that I've been through in my life, um, has allowed, all, all the way up to now, has allowed me to be able to write like I do. That's why I feel like my songs are like in 3D, you know, it's like the words are like right at you, you know, and I don't, I try not to cut corners. So like Michael Jordan, and I have to say, I have to say like Michael Jordan in the way that he's quite a perfectionist mm -hmm. and he doesn't like losing right. and, and, and things like that. Do you get, I mean, you're working with Sparkle now, which I'd like you to talk to me about, but also do you get slightly frustrated if somebody doesn't have the same, you know, get up and go that you have? I mean, how is it, how do you find producing and writing for somebody like Sparkle, for example? Do you have to tell her, you've got to do this, you've got to do that? Well, yeah, first of all, I do, I get very frustrated, you know, and that's maybe bad, maybe good. I feel it's good on my part, you know, because that's how Miss McGlynn was, that's how she was with me. Uh, she would get frustrated, hit me in my stomach, do whatever she had to do to get me to sing the right way. But I get very frustrated with, with, um, with people that I, I try to w work with and because I know I'm giving them two or three hundred percent. I'm giving them my all. It's the same thing I would give for me, I give for those who are right. Now sometimes even more, you know, because I'm on the outside looking in and that's a plus for me. Um, with Sparkle, her uh, particular situation, it was the same way. I, I gave her uh, uh, a choice, no choice, <laughs> you know, and told her she had to sleep on the couch and she had to show me, you know, that, that this is what she wanted. And her being a woman, um, if she did that, I never told her, but if she did that, that would really be a plus for her because she's a woman. You know, you don't get women, find too many women that's willing to come just sleep on the couch. To, to make it, to get into this business. Um, it's better than sleeping on a couch than sleeping in a bed, you know, because that happens also in this business. But uh, that wasn't her case. She just had to sleep on the couch and wait for me to, wait till a song come to me for her. And when it come, you're gonna get up off the couch and go in there to the mic and sing it, you know. And that's pretty much how her whole album came to be. The, the um, is, this is an aside. Many, many top R&B artists from the States sometimes tend to ignore Europe a little bit because it's a tough market. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not as fruitful as, say, America. You have to work ever so hard for less reward. Is that, is it, is, do you do it because you just want your music to be felt everywhere, or do you do it, I don't know, do you do it because you're, you're forced to by the record company? Yeah, it definitely p depends on what you're in this for, you know. And um, like I said earlier, I'm, I'm, I'm in this for the love. I love what I do, and, I, and it just amazes me that 12 years ago, I was in a basement of my girlfriend's grandma's house rehearsing and writing songs. And those very same songs here 12 years later, someone in Europe is singing. That's amazing to me, man. It's, it's just touching to me, man. So when I go over there, you know, it, is, you know, it, just, it just touches me, man. So that's why it's important to me to go over there and, and, and sing and, and, and just hear people sing my music and don't know English and they just sing my music. <laughs>
and sing new tracks <laughs> off your new album, Rated R, which is uh, what we're here and we're talking about. Um, we spoke about some collaborations earlier. There's one that stood out straight away <laughs> as a meeting of two of the you know, huge performers out there at the moment, and, and one that's not particularly from your genre, Celine Dion. Mm -hmm. Is this about a, a matter of two, two great singers collaborating, or is this something a little bit more cynical, or is this just something more organic? It's something more me being a um, A and R <laughs> a little bit, but uh, this is a very special song. Though. You know, it's a very special song. It's called Angel that I wrote, and um, as I was singing it and writing it, and, and I got done with it, it was missing something, and I realized that it, it needed a, a. I wanted a female voice with it, you know, and I thought about Celine, and I reached out, and um, I was very shocked to be honest that that. Uh, that we got a response, quick response, and that she would do it and everything. And, and we went to Canada and laid the vocals. And, uh, and I was amazed. And it came out amazing. Yeah, chance of a future single? Oh, definitely. Oh, definitely. And a worldwide smash, no doubt. Could be one of your biggest yet. Yeah, faithfully, I'm, I'm, that's what we're, you know, everybody is saying at the company. They loving the song. But the amazing thing about this album is that you can go from a duet with Celine Dion to a cut with Keith Murray, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Who's total homeboy, mm -hmm. you know, and, mm -hmm. and a track called Home Alone. Yeah. Well, when you get rid of the creativity and the collaboration, the thought of who's who, we're all human. And, you know, we're all on this earth together and, and, and we all breathe the same air. So, you know, but everybody have their own style. And, and that's what I'm trying to get people to appreciate when they hear this album. Don't just think of, well, now he got him, his that and other, and then now he's with her and he's with him, you know, but just think of it that way. We are all human, so we, we, the collaboration, that's what it's about, you know. Well, let's say a bit of that collaboration with Keith Murray. This is Home Alone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, let's talk about at least one more track off the album, I think, before we leave the album. Is you, you liked et cetera as well? You want to talk about et cetera? Oh, yeah. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's Radio 1, The Rhythm Nation, Sunday evening with R. Kelly, going through Rated R, his new double album. It's just, it's just R. Oh, sorry, it's, it's just R. Yeah. <laughs> just R. <that. laughs> <laughs> 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 oh, sorry, okay, okay. sorry, sorry. It's, oh, it's just got so much in my head. Sorry. <laughs> We're on The Rhythm Nation with me, Trevor Nelson, and R. Kelly, uh, playing tracks from his double album, R. And it's a hot one. Um, that was Keith Murray, Home Alone, with R. Kelly. And we spoke about collaboration with Celine Dion. And let's talk about another track on your album, Etc. Cetera. Et cetera. That's a very interesting track because when I was writing it, I didn't have a hook for it. <laughs> I wanted to talk about so many things I wanted to do um, with my girl that I couldn't fit it all into the chorus. So I ended up saying, and you know, et cetera, et cetera, like you do in a conversation. And then out of nowhere, I started thinking about how you make love, and then you go to the IHOP. And that's why I put that uh, in, the, in the bridge of the song. But the whole base, base of the song is, um, I want to do this, I want to do that, and et cetera, and et cetera, and et cetera. You know? So that's how that came about. Cool. <laughs> um, Really hope this album does fantastically well for you. Uh, Thanks, I'm sure man. it is. I think it's a landmark album again. Thanks. It just never ceased to amaze me. <laughs> Thanks, <man. laughs> but, um, is music is music totally the future for you? Music related things. Um, you know, y y you're financially secure now. Really, is there anything outlandish that we don't know about that you may be getting into? Oh. Other than music, no. I don't believe that for one minute. <laughs> Isn't that hard to believe? Isn't that hard to believe? I think there must be something uh, lurking I there. I tried to do the face and everything, and it didn't work. I out. don't believe that for oh. one minute. <laughs> Man. <laughs> There's a lot of things that, that I'm, I'm trying to do I just can't really get into now. But, you know, you guys are, you know, will find out eventually. But my, my whole thing right now, is, uh, and this is the truth, my whole thing right now is music and um, trying to get 
um, myself to a situation where the world knows my name and, and knows my music and uh, it'll go down in history. Is it a thing, is it this whole American thing of be the best you can be because you are a perfectionist with your songwriting as well, aren't you? So have you not completed the course yet for yourself? No, I haven't. No, it's still a lot more um, to go with. I still have a lot in me to come out. I can't say any more after that, really, can well, I? No, <laughs> artists um, that you admire and, and... Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and uh, the so song you composed for another Bruce artist. Um, the, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, we'll just throw that in, okay? Mm -hmm. um, we know, we can tell from your music the kind of artists that have inspired you. It's, it's, it's the Isleys and the Marvins and stuff. It's, <laughs> it's there. Yeah. Um, what about contemporary artists that you might admire as well? Mm. I, I don't, um, as far as... Well, it doesn't just have to be in the R&B field. It could be mm. any, any field. I mean, are, are there, are there any, is, is there anybody out there you'd think, well, I'd do that slightly different if I worked with that person? You know, you haven't worked with everybody. You've worked with, yeah. you, know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm it, always saying that. I'm always, listen, like I say, I listen to a song or see a movie, and I'm always critiquing. Even my stuff, I'm always saying, you know, not critiquing, not saying that it's wrong, but I always, you know, I'm a remix freak. I love remixing things. I love changing things around. So when I hear a song out there, or, or uh, Boys to Men, you know, I would hear some, something they do, and I love their voices and everything, and I'll say, oh, man, I would have put that there. Oh, man, or change that for a remix, you know. I, w I would think of things like that. I do that all the time. You've been involved in a few remixes. You were recently on the Wycliffe. Yeah. I was, I was surprised that you were on that remix, actually, right. you know, not being on the <laughs> original, too. but on the remix. It's, uh -huh. Um, was that just a, f a phone call, a favor, or, you know, how did that? was just me and him being in the same studio in the same building and just tripping out all night. And um, I was in the studio hanging out with him, and, uh, and we had a track up and just went in there to the mic and did it. And it, it just, they put it out, you know, that's how that happened. He's a typical example of what, what can just happen overnight yeah. for people because, yeah. you know, again, he's an artist who was keeping it very much real with his with the first album and then they kind of broke into a more commercial thing yeah and and have had huge success and then the power that gives you to do what you want to do that's right um, which is proven with with your success as well and what mm -hmm. you want to get into right. so so um I, one question i haven't asked you is your lifestyle mm -hmm. it is quite obviously quite grand compared to what it was mm -hmm. but i noticed that there are times when i feel that you you miss the innocence and the, the hunger, possibly, you know, when, when it was tough, when it was hard, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I mean, I do I, all the time. Even now, I, I miss that. I, I, I really do. I miss, um, but see, that's why my songs are what they are, because I don't forget where I come from, and, and I miss it every night and day, where I come from. And that's why uh, there's a certain humbleness about my music and what I do is because a lot of people sometimes they forget all about that. They don't even want to think about um, that dish rag and, uh, on the floor and that small one bedroom apartment. They don't want to think about it, but I actually miss it. You know, I actually get to myself and wish that, man, I, sometimes I roll down the street and I say, you know what, I'm going to get me an apartment right over there and get me a studio apartment because I just want to do that because it, it feels good. It reminds me of my mother. It reminds me when we were one family. So that's very important to me. That's who I am, really. This, whole, this, this sort of isolation that you get because you are now at a certain level and there are only a few people that are at that level with you, does that, does that make it even that much harder to how can I put it, to write songs just from the heart because you're clinging on to that, that feeling of the past that, that keeps you, you, you know what I'm saying? You mm -hmm. say you write songs and you can get that emotion out of you yeah. because you've been from the school of hard knocks, you know. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it hard to keep clinging on and sometimes does it mess with you, you know, just thinking because the bad things come up all the time? Yeah, it, it does. It, it, it hurts sometimes actually when I, when I uh, be around other guys or girls, my friends, that 
are not as successful as I am and they don't do what I do. They just regular nine to five or whatever they do. And uh, and I look at, or if I go to an old girlfriend's house to see her grandmother because we were close and, 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 I, and it shows me how much I've been groomed and how much I've grown. And, and uh, it's, it's enough to, to make you cry because it just, it just hurts sometimes. Well, if you lost it all tomorrow. Yeah, that's definitely that's a good way in doing it. <laughs> <laughs> if you lost it all tomorrow, what would you do? But maybe kill yourself? <laughs> oh, you might not. No. Hmm. Yeah, if, 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 if I pulled a rug from beneath your feet tomorrow and you fell flat on your back and you were more or less penniless again, do you think you're strong enough to, to, to continue living or continue with what, you're trying, what you've been trying to do all your life or? Well, I, I'm, I, I couldn't answer that question because that thought is so far um, out of my mind and out of my reach that I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even, I would advise anybody not to even, ugh, not to even think on anything like that because I just couldn't, I'm, I, I wouldn't imagine it because I've worked too hard <laughs> to get to where I am. I work too hard, and I still continue to work hard. I work just as hard now as I work to get where I am now. Who inspires you to do that? Did somebody else inspire you to be like that? Are there people you look at and you just say, that guy or that woman sh is showing me the way? Mm, I don't know, man. It's just, it's just something in me that is just continuing to drive. You know, when I think of me, I think of the Titanic. Not in a sinking way, but when it was, when it was sailing. I want to mention one other person before we, we end the interview, and that's Michael Jackson, who is a veteran of this industry and a record-selling artist of this industry. And I, you know, I read that when you worked with him, you were a bit nervous at first, but the moment you got into it, you just felt, yeah, this is, this is what it's about. You know? mm -hmm. was, was that possibly your... In recording and working with somebody else, was that probably the, the pinnacle of your career this, so far? Yeah, that was a big, 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 big pause moment for me, you know, when Michael stepped in the studio and, or even asked me to write a song. I mean, uh, at the point that he did it, I, I, I never thought that it would happen, even though Miss McGlynn told me a long, long time ago that Michael Jackson's going to ask you to write for him one day. And I would just laugh at that because that's so funny to me because I don't believe in all of that psychic stuff, man. I just don't get in all of that, you know. So, and when she said it, you know, I couldn't believe it. And when he when he asked me, first thing I thought about was her. And um, I said, but I'm still not gonna believe. I mean, this has got to pass before I can say, you know, I've done this. And uh, when I did the song. When he came into the studio, yeah, I was overwhelmed, nervous, uh, and all of those things. But I was professionally that way. I was, uh, um, I wasn't so nervous. I would faint when he came into the room. But once I, once he came into the room, I went in the bathroom and fainted, and um, <laughs> kind of fell out. Then, but then after that, I came back. Like it was no big deal. He was here and we continued to work, you know, I offered him some Chinese food, you know, the whole nine, you know. Uh, things kind of smoothed out after smoothed out after that. <laughs> well the result was the, the result you, you couldn't have dreamed for, but it was the right result, yeah. Was, yeah, oh definitely. So you left the mark. Yeah. Okay, great. Anyone you want to um, work with? Yeah, aside from Michael Jackson. Is there anybody aside from who you've worked with already that you'd you'd love to work with? Yeah, I got a couple of songs that I, I just wrote like three weeks ago for Golf Brooks. Hopefully, you know, hopefully that'll happen. He returned a call. <laughs> That's <laughs> well. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> anyway, R. Kelly, it's been, hopefully, fa safely. It, it's been fantastic talking to you, meeting you again. Um, like, like I said, I think the album's fantastic. I'm not just saying Thanks, that. Man. It's, Thanks, man. It's, it's, it's another piece of art. Well, and, I appreciate um, it. You know, if, if you've got a message for, for your European fans, just please tell them what to expect. Well, I would tell them to, uh, I don't want to tell them to expect the bomb album because I want them to be the judge of that. I don't know that when I make it over there, but I would like to tell them to keep their heads up. If anybody struggling musicians is trying to make it, 
Keep God in your life first. Believe that you can. Believe that you can. And that's the only way you're going to do it. You've got to take that negative energy out and think and, and don't let anybody tell you that you can't because if you can think it, if you can, if you can see it, then it can be done. It's just up to you to believe that. Uh -huh.